Uh, okay, so before we watch this video, your video for Nim's Time on Glass, you guys should know about uh, algorithms, because this video is called How Algorithms Shape Our World. So just what the hell are algorithms, because it's a good idea to know what algorithms are. Before you watch this video, does anybody know what algorithms are? It's like a series of functions and the order of the pick of them. Okay, so one definition, absolutely correct. Series of functions and the order they go in. Any other perspectives or definitions on it? Any other ways to describe algorithms? Or other ways that you think about them if you know about them? How many people have never really heard that word before, algorithms? Okay, a couple people. How many people have heard that word? Billy and... So uh, the way I think of algorithms is just an algorithm is a solution to a problem. Kind of the easiest definition. It's just a solution to a problem. So you have algorithms every day that you use. You have an algorithm for, be for getting dressed. And your algorithm for getting dressed, for putting on clothes, probably entails, you know, uh, pants first, then shoes. Right? And things have to happen in a certain order. You put your socks on first, then you put your shoes on. You get your pants on first, then you get your shoes on. Because if you put your shoes on, then put on your socks, then try to put on your pants, it just doesn't come out looking right. So the order in which you do something to accomplish a goal, that's an algorithm. You have algorithms for washing your hair. Wet your hair, rinse, lather. Well, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I can't think of it at the moment, but you know what I'm saying, right? Shampoo, rinse, oh, there you go, that repeat, whatever, that algorithm. You have algorithms for making toast. Take the toast out of the plastic bag. Take the bread out of the plastic bag before you put it in the toaster. Don't try to put it in the toaster while it's in the plastic bag. So these are all algorithms. And in computer programming, we'll, we'll talk about algorithms, meaning like, oh, we have an algorithm that will calculate your grade. Or we have an al algorithm that knows when to trade stock on the stock market. So these are all ways that we think about algorithms. In some ways, the word algorithms can be used interchangeably. The word algorithms can be used interchangeably just with a program, like a computer program. So one way we might read this is how computer programs shape our world. So this video is called How Algorithms Shape Our World. And uh, you know the guy just talks about the thing that really stands out to me from this video is that over three-fourths of all the trades on Wall Street are now automatically executed by computers. Just think about that for a second. So, you know, your, re your parents' retirements, maybe your retirement, your investments. You know, the stock market, three-fourths of the trades, computers are the ones making the trades based upon what they think are the right times to trade. That's kind of crazy. They're kind of designed to have thresholds when it hits a certain point to buy or sell. I don't know, but yeah, that sounds like a good definition. That would be a very... Uh, yeah, to look for opportunities, you know, and, you know, if, if movements start to occur with a certain velocity, right, like if it starts to trend a certain way, then let's get out, you know, or let's get in, let's ride it, and then get out, and whatever people decide they're going to write to try to play the game. So Marley, named after the great musician, yes, uh, I heard an awesome song, I don't know if it's Marley. I was listening to some cool reggae today at lunch. They have these uh, food trucks out by Kaiser area, somewhere out there. They're playing some reggae. Marley, would you please hit the lights for us? Your computer should, at this point, be trending towards off. Here is uh, how algorithms shape our world. We're making. And the, the landscape was always made by this sort of weird, uneasy collaboration between nature and man. But now there's this kind of third co-evolutionary force, algorithms, the Boston Shuffler, the Carnival. And we will have to understand those as nature. And in a way, they are. Thank you. Hey, Marley, thank you very much. We'll hit the lights, hit them all. Ah, interesting. Anybody have any thoughts or comments or reflections? Or shall we just jump into the nitty gritty of programming ourselves? Let's create our own algorithms. Let's become masters of the universe from our parents' garages and basements. We will rule the world. We're gonna rule the world. And you could. 
you write the right algorithm, you could just go see the most recent James Bond movie, Skyfall. It's good. I liked it. It's great. What was that one? Yeah. Mm, Cloud Atlas. Good. Uh, Cloud Atlas is also good. Um, different. Okay. I've been a movie junkie recently. Uh, thoughts or reflections on this movie that we just saw? Going once. I went over my head. Over your head? I, I get I do get a bit, but you were just going off on all these tangents that I'm just like, you can't make connections with or relate to it. So it didn't impact me as much as it seemed to with the other people watching it in the audience there. Yeah, that's true. There's a lot of information that's delivered in that short period of time. I've had the good fortune of having watched this in several classes for a few semesters now. <laughs> so, watch it 12 times, it'll synthesize. What's up? Oh, that's, I, I was just wondering, uh, kind of, I don't know, um, isn't that just how people regularly talk, like they're going on one topic and then they go to another one, they come back, and then they're like all over the place, that's how it seemed like he was talking. Like, you know, Oh yeah, I remember the picture at the end. Yeah, I don't know. And I thought that that photo was really interesting. Um, yeah, interesting photo, huh? Yeah, the, the, so photos are interesting, like uh, you know, because a lot of people don't consider photography an art form. And um, I thought what that person did was actually pretty good. Like you know, he's using a trend in an image. Yeah, I think that's an awesome. Image. I thought that was, like, I, that was my favorite part of the whole thing. Well, I think that, and that's illustrative, illustrative, whatever that word is. I can write it. I don't necessarily know how to say it, but I think that illustrates, uh, you know, kind of how computers are shaping our world. You know, like um, we can take images, which even in itself is pretty amazing to be able to take a picture. At one point, that was high tech. But we could take images and then we could transform those images and, and we could make them art so that they're metaphors of uh, something else. So here we have the image which is tracing the movements of the stock market, of an of a equities market, and, um, and it's depicted as part of the earth, as mountains, you know, which is just an interesting creation. Interesting commentary too. Computers shaping our world. Uh, I've heard a lot of this before, but I had never heard the idea that um, scripts, movie scripts, can be run through an algorithm nowadays, and they can just tell you, "Yeah, this is this could be a thirty million dollar movie," and, and and I'm guessing it's probably pretty accurate. With that kind of I don't know social awareness, you know, for what people are going to like. And the way that the industry is moving, where you've heard about like the 3D printers and everything else, obviously you know you have a freaking Star Trek replicator, you know, and it, and it, big giant factory to do that. Um, I think it'd be really interesting to find out, like, oh, everybody's trending toward health food, and suddenly health food starts showing up in stores without any human involvement, because that's that's what you know the machines start making. And then they see that, oh, people are loving, you know, James Bond style movies. And suddenly the box office is hit with 15. And just before we even know we don't like something, they've already caught on that people are starting to get disinterested and moved on to something else. And, uh, I think with the, the way algorithms work and, and the way they're seeping into everything, uh, eventually, eventually your whole life will run around al algorithms and, and the guy with the best algorithm will win and it'll probably be like a Google or a Facebook or one of those companies that owns most of your information anyway? Yeah, great points. I, it, it becomes self-determinative in some ways, you know, like, uh, you know, in some ways it's both, I'm not sure if I'm using the right words, prescriptive in the sense that it's reading us and figuring out what do we want, like Netflix has an algorithm, it tries to figure out what we want and then give that to us, but then it could also become deterministic, right, where, uh, you know, the algorithms are giving us what they think we want, it might not necessarily be what we want, but that's what we're, we're, we're being given, you know, um, so it starts to determine, the computers start to determine our world in some ways, 
So both looking at us and trying to figure out what we want, you know, and meet that, but then at the same time, you know, uh, giving us what they think we want, determining in some ways what, what we want. Because it, computers, algorithms are only as good as the person who wrote them. So who the hell's, who's the hell to say, who the hell's to say, you know, what is correct and what is incorrect? And obviously there's some really smart people who can look at data and crunch those numbers and look at and find trends. And we could even see trends if we just looked at dollar volume for action movies versus romance versus buddy cop movies versus war movies versus horror. We'd be like, well, wow, we need to make whatever movie, you know. So, yeah, interesting. You had something more to say, Billy? Oh, yeah. Um, I was just thinking, with what you said about then determining our what we want and determining what we need, at what point, I, I mean, it's kind of like sci-fi here, but at what point do we go from being the masters to the pets? Yeah. At what point are they just taking care of us like a yeah. cat? Yeah. We wake up, yeah. we sleep, we eat. Yeah. And they give us toys, and then yeah. we go to bed, and then they take care of us, and then they right. deal with everything. Right. Yeah. So it becomes sort of like Wally in some ways, where we're just all yeah. flying around on our recliners, completely overweight, <laughs> or you know, or it becomes like um, Hal, you know, in Space Odyssey 2001, where Hal knows what's best for the mission, or or like the Alien movies also had that theme. Uh, where, you know, uh, the computer robot was making determinations about what the crew should be doing, which included killing some of the crew, you know, letting some of them go. Yeah, so just a really interesting play there. And it's not science fiction. When 70% of the trade's being executed on Wall Street, that's, I think that's one of his points, you know, are occurring based, they're just algorithmic trades, algo trading, black box trading, when 70% of the trades are occurring, that's vastly significant. Those are that's the largest financial market in the in the world. That's economics. That's livelihood. That's jobs. You know, and I'm not sure how all those play together, but you know, the stock markets where companies get their equity to make things happen. When 9% of it disappears and nobody's quite sure where it went, you know, because these algorithms. Uh, could get locked in competing interests or loops, it becomes interesting and it does start to shape our world. And when we start to literally shape our world, blowing up, putting in new cables so that we could have, you know, trades which occur 15 milliseconds faster, at what point is that insanity, right? Or we're hollowing out office buildings so humans aren't going to work there anymore, computers are going to be working there. We need this, this office building is best for its location because of its location for humans. I mean, for computers, no longer for humans. I mean, it's just fascinating a little like bit. Like we're already the slaves of computers. They've told us, you, you slaves, go dig here and, and make us a nice little home. And then and we did it. We went and kicked out humans from a building, and we were like, here you go, computers. Yeah. Yeah, it's, well, it's, a, it's, the, it's the entire yin and yang. It's impossible for me to separate humans from computers. Because... Uh, you know, it's the humans who are saying, hey, I want to make money using computers, and to do that, I need a faster trade, which means I have to blow up this trench to make the computers be able to do that. I like the phrase, pragmatic chaos. I think that's a really cool name for a program, you know, trying to make sense out of chaos. And then it determines the culture, you know, which movies we consume, right? It's determined by that which I think is interesting. So, yeah, a very, very uh, kind of thought-provoking video, and also one that goes a pretty quick clip. All right, so today we're going to talk about programming. How many people in here have uh, had some experience with programming? Let me see a show of hands. You've created some kind of a computer program before. Awesome. <laughs> Good, so we're, 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 uh, we're uh, cutting fresh tracks here through the powder. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of an overview of kind of programming, and then I'll show you guys a little bit of VB programming. And VB stands for Visual Basic, and I'd love to hear your thoughts and have you chime in for those of you who've had a little bit of experience with, you know, programming and things like that. Um, I like this quote. 
Uh, I left. I used to have quotes in all my slides, but as I kind of moved away from PowerPoint, they'd kind of fall away too. But this one still remained. Mark Twain quote. Hello. Hi. Glad you made it. It's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. It's a cool one. All right. So uh, programs and algorithms. A program is nothing more than a set of instructions that tell a computer how to do something. That's all a program is. A set of instructions that tell a computer how to do something. Right? So, you know, pretty basic definition. What's a program? A set of instructions tells a computer how to do something. You know, print this. You know, show me that. Process this. You know, change the color of this image to that. Right? So that's all a program is. A set of instructions tells a computer how to do something. Algorithms are step-by-step -step instructions. They must be explicitly precise, right? So to illustrate those two points, I want to have you guys program me, okay? I want you to program me. Are you guys ready to program me? Let me see what's the best angle. Uh, all right. Truck keys, okay? To a very nice Tacoma. If you could program me, with, uh, without making a mistake, I will give you a candy bar. <laughs> Not my new Tacoma. Just in case somebody was to actually do it. And then I'd be like, dang, and then they'd be like, it's on video. I'd be like, no, I'm not giving you my Tacoma. I'll give you a candy bar. I will. I've got a candy bar in my office. I'm going to get it. If you can program me to go over and pick up my keys without making a mistake, you get a candy bar. And so, to do that, I am tabula rasa. I am a blank slate. I know nothing. And to program me, a program is a set of instructions. And to create the algorithm, you have to be explicitly precise. Explicitly precise. Step-by-step -step instructions. Because if you leave something out, if you say, all right, now take the bread and put it in the toaster, but you forgot to tell me to take the bread out of the plastic bag, I'm going to be trying to shove that whole plastic bag of bread into the toaster. All right? So you've got it step by step, explicitly precise, everything. So this is to illustrate just how, how detail-oriented and minutia-oriented programming is. You've got to think of every possibility, and it just becomes granular, granular down to the comma and the semicolon and accounting for every little possibility, including it all. All right? All right. So program me to pick up my keys and you want a candy bar. Who wants to take a shot at it? It's a candy bar, man. All right? Go for it. One, two, three, four, <laughs> five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Okay, go back. Five steps. One, two, three, four, five. Go up a half step. One. Okay, very good. You can you can get the picture. Kind of like a human comedy, human comedy, physical comedy. But you got to be really precise. And I could have been more of a dork about it. I could have tried to pick up the keys without closing my fingers because he said never said close my fingers. What a good sport! Did a great job. Give him a hand. But you kind of get it, right? You got to be explicitly precise. So that making. Making toast, example, you guys get it? You gotta take it out of the plastic bag, all that. There's a joke I heard one time. A programmer had been missing from work 
For over a week, when finally somebody noticed it and called the cops, they went around to his flat and broke down the door. They found him dead in the shower with an empty bottle of shampoo next to his body. Apparently, he'd been washing his hair. The instructions on the shampoo bottle said, wet hair, apply shampoo, wait two minutes, rinse, repeat. <laughs> <laughs> so since he's a programmer and he did everything so literally, there was never like, only do it three times. There was no exit to the loop, right? And so that would be an infinite loop. Sometimes you'll hear about infinite loops. And an infinite loop in programming means you tell it to do something, and it just keeps doing it. Like he told me to turn to the left, so I just kept turning and turning and turning to the left, right? So that's, a, that's an infinite loop. And those are actually called control structures. That's called a control structure. This was a question we asked prospective em employees when we were interviewing to find another instructor for the Computer Information Technology Department at Fresno City College, right? During the interview, like the people submitted resumes, this is how much education I've had. This is how much work experience I've had, right? And so obviously there's a bunch of questions, but we asked them to teach us what control structures were. What are control structures? Like, wow. And half the people were like, I don't know, just drew a blank. I don't know if it's half. But some people who came kind of, kind of described to us what control structures were. You now get to learn that. So a control structure controls how the computer reads the program. It's a little bit of a metaphor, but let's go with it. It's how the computer reads the program. So how do you read a book? You read a book, you start at the front, and you, you know, often, and you just read to the back. That's how you read it. Computers will read a program the same way. They start at the top, and they just go down through the code until they hit the bottom, or until they hit some other kind of statement which tells them to stop reading it. Right? So they just start executing the code top to bottom. All right, and uh, and then some of the things that you could put in there. So that that kind of control structure would be a sequence, sequence control structure. Start at the bot top, just go to the bottom, and it just runs the procedures. There's an entry point, and there's an exit point. Okay, the one that we were just talking about with the shampoo guy who died in the shower, that would be a loop, or a repetition, or a do a while, do while, or do until. Right? So I like to think of them as loops. Sometimes they're called repetitions. Sometimes they're called do while or do until. And so a loop would say, so how would you use that? Right? So if I had a piece of computer code, and this was how I calculated a grade for a student, like, you know, find out what's their average on the assignments, find out what's their average on the quizzes, find out what they got on the final, find out what they got on my IT lab, find out what they got for participation. Right, and I'll take these and give them their certain weights and add them all up, and that's the grade. That's how you calculate the grade for one student. And then I could say, now do this right, while there are still students who it hasn't been done for. So 30 students does it for the first student, the second student, the third student, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, the 29th student, the 30 student. Are there any more students? Nope. And so it exits the loop. So it does it for each student. That's a loop. Does that make sense? So that would be a loop control structure. A sequence control structure just goes straight top to bottom. And then the selection control structure is like a, a if statement. If then. If this is the case, then do that. And so that's a decision kind of making control structure. All right. So those are the three control, control structures. You have sequential, you have loop, you have conditional. Sequential, loop, conditional. Or sequential repetition conditional. So you can see them there. I just kind of put it in the notes there. Those are the three control structures. So how would the if-then statement work? Right? Well, you use if-then statements all the time in your life. If it is Tuesday and it's 3 o'clock, then I should be in class. Right? Else, if that's not the case, you know, look at calendar and think, of, think about what else I should be doing. Or, you know, do whatever I want. If it is raining, then bring my umbrella. Else, you know, leave umbrella at home or whatever. So that's kind of like the selection. So in programming, it might be, you know, if user is logged in, then, you know, show them their customer account info. Else, ask them to log in. All right? So you can check to see if people are logged in. So that would be an if-then statement. 
Does that make sense how those three work? So that's really good to know, the control structures. It kind of controls the structure of how the code is written. All right. When I first started writing computer code, which might, makes me sound like I'm an incredible coder and I've been writing for a long time, which is not the case. <laughs> I am not a computer programmer. I have created some pretty cool websites back in the day. And, uh, and I did start writing BASIC in 1983. I started writing BASIC, so that's a long time ago. And uh, back then, it was spaghetti code. And your code, your code was uh, just uh, all on, in one document, basically one big page of code. And that was known as spaghetti code, because it was really hard to try to follow that code, follow the logic of it. Because you'd have all of these different statements, and they just say, go to here. If this is the case, go to here. If that's the case, go to here. If that's the case, go to here. And then you'd be in that piece and it'd be like, well, if this is the case, go to there. And it'd just be like following strands of spaghetti in a bowl, trying to figure out what is the logic of this program. Because uh, all of the little go here, go there, and it's all in the same big, long document, which could be hundreds, thousands of pages long, it's just impossible to trace, really difficult to trace. So that was called spaghetti code. Does that make sense? Like, If somebody's asking you what's spaghetti code, how would you describe it? I don't want you guys just to be like, okay, that makes sense, go on. You need a little bit more of an example? How many people get what spaghetti code is? Awesome, we got two hands. <laughs> I wonder if we could lean on our old friend YouTube. Programming humor. Never know what we're going to get. Program code can often end up looking like a load of spaghetti. Well, let's see what this guy has to say about it. That's kind of cool. I like it. All right, here we go. Spaghetti code. It's hard to understand, it gets worse as it builds up. Right? So here's just like a lot of jumbled lines of code. Kind of a bunch of spaghetti. What a mess. Trying to figure out what all the different little lines do. Organizing spaghetti code. Reduce complexity, organize into logical components. And what did that say? Limited interfaces? Mm -hmm. Alright, so here we're organizing it breaking it into different chunks. I don't know how instructive this is. It's the first time I've tried to explain spaghetti code. Easier to manage spaghetti. Just you guys are completely lost now. You're like, what the hell does spaghetti have to do with programming? <laughs> what? I don't get it. But look, doesn't that... Oh, I can make sense of that. Look, this strand's there, that strand's there. I can follow each strand. They're connected. Okay, look at that there. Doesn't that kind of just look somehow a little bit more organized? You guys are like, I have no idea what spaghetti code is. Can we show you or you want me to give up on spaghetti code? How many people would want to see? How many people do not want to see? I think there's a line numbering here. <clears throat> View. Review. You know, I have not used help since this, oh, there it is, up there. And uh, line numbering. Add, remove line numbers. Add line numbers. Da, 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 da. Uh, go page layout, page setup, click line numbers. Page layout, page setup, click line numbers. Here we go. Continuous, restart each page, restart each section, uh, continuous, and line numbering options, let's uh, section page preview, start section, start new page, even page, I'm not seeing line, line numbers, there we go, uh, count by 10, start at 1, okay, okay, 
So where are my line numbers? Where did my line number go? I said line numbering option. Add line numbering. Continue. All right, we mm -hmm. want just one, I guess. Not going to show up. I get to ten. All right, so here's the idea. Like uh, init uh, initiate and uh, define variable. Variable, variable, uh, name, uh, ask for name entry, uh, receive data, assign to name, variable, display variable name, um, Ask, do you want to play a game? If yes, then go to 40. If no, then go to 10. Blah, blah, 10. Sorry, display, display. Sorry, you don't want to play a game. Name variable or whatever and then lines, and then finally we get to line 40. Welcome to the game. Name variable. You guys see this? Here we go. Let's make it bigger. Play. Welcome to the game. Name variable. I gotta make it a little bit smaller. Almost there. Have you played before? If yes, go to 20. Line 20. If no, go to line 50. Oh, I'm going to come back here to line 20. Display. Great. Glad you played before. Go to line 80 to begin game. And then 50. No. Have you played before? Display. Great, glad this is your first time. Okay, so you were able to trace all of the logic that I was doing. Okay, well, if you haven't played, if you have played before, go to 20. If you haven't played before, okay, go to 50, right? But when I start putting all that code into one, one document, right? And even, even though it makes sense as you're watching it, you know, so, okay, here is... You know, if yes, go to 40. Do you want to play a game? If no, go to 10. Okay, they don't want to play him. Sorry, you don't want to go. Sorry, you don't want to play. Because they said no, they don't want to play. Just play sorry, you don't want to play. If they said yes, okay, come down here to line 40. Uh, welcome to the game. You know, great. It tells them that. Have you played before? If yes, go to line 20. Okay, yes. Line 20 is right here. You know, and it says, great. Glad you played before. If no, go to line 50. Line 50 is right here and it says, oh, uh, great, glad this is your first time. You know, and it's just like, okay, I could follow those jumps where I'm going within that document, but it gets confusing. Okay? That's spaghetti code. That's how they used to write programs. Doesn't that seem like a really stupid way to write programs? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That was a rhetorical <laughs> question, honestly. <laughs> And that's how they used to do it. It kind of reminds me of, I don't know what they were called, but there were novels where you chose the... Yes! The, yes! Now. Yeah. So what? if you want to go ahead and enter the house, go to page whatever, and you, you know, stuff like that. Okay. Exactly. That is a great analogy. That's exactly how this crap used to be. That's spaghetti code. So how many people feel like, oh, okay, I get it, what spaghetti code is now? Let me see your hands. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, so how can we make that better? How can we make that better? 
how can we structure it a little bit differently so it's not like that? Let's reinvent computer programming right here, right now. See if you guys come up with the same solution. Any ideas? Well, I know how we ended up doing it. Any ideas from the people who don't know how we ended up doing it? What would you do? Is this the best solution? You make it <coughs> visual. Make it visual, kind of like what? Um, kind of like how do you do your, um, like your, um, like, um, what, like you're just a blackboard? Uh huh. Tell us how to do it. You can make like that and show us. Okay, yeah, so hey, that'd be cool if we could make a program that's just like a graphical user interface. A wissy wiggy, what you see is what you get. We just drag and drop stuff around. That's an awesome idea for the user interface. Uh, and uh, what's the code going to look like behind that? You know, so is it just going to be a big chunk of one big document like this? How, how do you guys do things often now? Do you have one big document, like one big textbook? Or do you learn a little bit about this and then you go to some other resource and you, you get some information from another resource and then you go to another resource and get some information from that resource? Table of contents. So maybe we could have a table of contents. So this is begging for some sort of organization, some sort of structure. Okay, and we want to break this problem down. And actually that's, that's you know, however we can break it apart, break it apart and break it down into manageable chunks. Okay, here's this one chunk, here's another chunk. We want to break that down. That's actually called top-down design in programming. Breaking the program down into manageable chunks. Okay, it's also called structured programming. We're going to break it into little modules which do something, structured programming. All right, so what, what maybe will those modules look like? Well, one module is called the welcome module, right? And so uh, welcome, you know, all that one little chunk of code is going to do is welcome people and ask them if they've played before, right? And then we'll have another module uh, for, you know, new players. So if they say, no, I've never played before, then we'll call that other chunk of code, which we just keep over here in another document. Okay, now run this chunk of code for people who've never played before, and it'll show them welcome, this is how you play, you know? And for people who have played before, okay, well, why don't you just go straight to whatever, you know, this, this other module. Okay, if they play before, we'll run this other module for people who've played before, which might ask them, you know, what's your level, which car did you drive, which weapons did you like, you know, what level do you want to start at now, pick back up at now. Or do you have a username and password so we can remember all that for you. So you break everything up into little chunks, little modules. Structure it, structure programming. So that's the idea behind... Uh, Procedural programming or structured programming. Programs are separated into modules and, or subprograms, and we call the subprograms when needed. So we break the big program up into small little chunks of little small programs, and each little small module does something. Each little small module does something. And doing it that way, right, focuses us on the step by step instructions that tell the computer what to do. We use procedures or modules. Uh, smaller sections of code perform particular tasks, allows each procedure to perform as many times as needed without requiring multiple copies of the code. And the top-down design is to break the problem into small chunks. So what does all that mean? So you never want to have to write the same code twice. You always want to reuse your code. So when you, when you need to change a piece of code, you only need to change it in one location. And any time you need to use that chunk of code, it's always available uh, to be used. So maybe, you know, uh, maybe the code for authenticating a user uh, at a website. I'm going to write that code once. How do I authenticate a user at a website? Well, I have to take their username and password, submit it to the database. If it returns a record, then they're authenticated. And if it doesn't, then it sends them to some other module that you know deals with them not being authenticated. Sorry, we the incorrect username or password, please try again. Right? And so wherever I want to have somebody log in, that little chunk of code gets called and used. And it could be on different websites or different programs. I could have that little chunk of code. 
So that's uh, that's the idea behind structured programming, breaking a program down into into little chunks. So here's an idea of like instead of having the program in one big long page of code, there's all these little chunks. Like here's here's the chunk for computing federal tax. Here's the chunk for computing state tax. And it's just like a little group of code that when state tax needs to be computed, okay, well here's that little code that gets run, that little block of code. And then structured programming gave rise to object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming. So object-oriented programming is the same idea as structured programming, but it said, hey, let's also have structured programming concepts apply to objects. So we never want to recreate, uh, recreate objects. All right? So in the visual programming environment, if uh, we have a button, you know, there's going to be buttons, there's going to be forms, there's going to be uh, dialog boxes. We don't want to have to write the code for a button but one time. Like, here's the code for a button. And anytime I need to use a button, place a button, I just say, well, there's the code for a button. And I can change certain things about the button. So the button is going to have uh, variables that can be changed. What's the text on the button? What's the color of the button? And then the button also has things that it does, right? Like a button can be pushed. And when you push a button, it tells the program to take action. Well, what action gets taken? Right? So objects have variables and methods. You guys are like, wow, this just became a computer class. Objects have variables and methods. Variables, the color, what's set on the button, right? And then the methods, what a button does. And a button is different than like uh, a, a, a text box in terms of what it does. A text box does something different than a button. A text box receives text. A button, you know, allows you to push it. So the, the, the methods of a button and the methods of a text box are two different things. The point being objects and object-oriented programming, they have variables, they have methods. Variables, what's on the button, right? What color is the button? Methods, what the button does or what the text box does. So you only write the, the code for a button once. You only write the code for a text box once. And anytime you need uh, a button, you just use an iteration of that code. You say, put that code here. So that's object-oriented programming. So we went from spaghetti code to structured programming, breaking it into chunks, which we could then call little sub-procedures to then like let's actually take that into a visual environment where we're applying that to our objects and it's object oriented programming. Alright? And there's obviously more to it about classes and inheritance and things like that, which the textbook gets a little bit more in depth with that, but I'm gonna keep it a little bit more simple. I think that's far enough in. I'm gonna show you guys. Do you want to see an example of what object oriented programming looks like? So, how many people have done the Visual Basic assignment yet? Cool. So, this is the assignment that you need to do. And the video is obviously there in the assignments area. So, you can watch this video again closer up and in more detail. But I just come into Visual Studio. I say, hey, I want to do a new project. And this is called uh, SDK. SDK. What does SDK stand for? Software development kit. So this is a little piece of software that helps me develop software. And one of the amazing things about the technology age is we use computers to make computers, which sounds kind of incestuous or something. I don't know. <laughs> right? Inbred. A bunch of hillbillies in Alabama or something. We're using computers to make computers, but I guess that's the way all of nature works, right? We use humans to make humans, but the faster computers get, the faster they can make new computers that are faster, right? So it's kind of an interesting deal. But a software development kit is software that allows us to write software. So this is an SDK to write software. I'm going to do a Visual Basic application. I could do C Sharp, C++, right? Database stuff. I'm going to go with Visual Basic. I'm going to do a Windows application, Windows Form application. I'm going to call it Mood Controller. And I'm going to put it onto my desktop. And OK. And 
And then I get into my little environment where I can create my program. And I'm going to get rid of a few windows that I don't want to look at. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, bye, bye. And hello, hello, hello. So I got my toolbox on the left. I got my properties on the right. I'm going to pin my toolbox into place. Here's my form right here. Okay. Well, I got buttons here. I need to, if I need to add buttons, I, first of all, I'm starting out with the form. So this is an object. And this object has certain methods. Forms do certain things. They hold other pieces of crap for you to display to people. Text boxes, buttons. This form also has, you know, variables. So a form has methods, things it does, has variables. The vari one of the variables is what is the title at the top of the form, right? Like if I, if I go to start, control panel, and mouse, this is nothing but a form. This is nothing but a form, my friend, right here, right? It's a form, that's it. And up at the top, it's called mouse properties. And then this form has that other stuff put on it. So on top of my form, if I wanted to, I could come over here and where here's the variables which I could change, right? I could change the text form one to mouse properties if I wanted to. And now up here it says mouse properties. Pretty cool, huh? Speaking of which, I think I will change a mouse property. Uh, 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 uh. So now I can do this and draw your attention. But I'm not going to call it mouse properties. I'm going to call it mood controller. Because you know what? Uh, it's actually m -m -m mood controller. It's for cows. Mood controller. Because who wouldn't want to just be able to push button and be happy? All the time. Right? And now what we're trying to get to as American consumers? Maintain some state of perfection. All right, I'll, I won't get too philosophical. All right, so there's my mood controller form. Now I'm going to add buttons to my form. Button, button, button. And it kind of aligns them for me. I can select them all and then move them over. That's good enough. I can evenly distribute them. Format, align, make same size, horizontal spacing. Uh, make equal, so I just made them equal format. Vertical spacing, make equal. Ah, edit, undo, that the format. Make same size, align, centers, nope, edit, undo. Format, align, middles, there we go. So now they're kind of evenly. So there's my button. I'm going to call this button here. I'm going to call it sad. So buttons have methods, you can push them, they have variables. I'm going to call this button chill. How many people are interested? Let me see your hands. I'm going to call this button happy. How many people are not interested? Let me see your hands. How many people are not showing me your hands? Let me see your hands. Okay, just checking. So now my button says sad, chill, happy. Now I need something to display a happy face. I'm going to use a label. So I'm just going to drag a label and put it out there, and I'm going to change the text of my label to capital K, because in Wingdings, capital K is uh, face, and I'm going to go over here and change my font to Wingdings, and I'm going to change the size to 200, make it big, go big, or go home. So there's my little face. And now I'm ready to program. Object-oriented programming, right? I've been dragging objects out. I don't have to create the code for a button. I don't have to create the code for a text box or for a label. I don't have to create the code for a form. Uh, those, that code all exists. Each little object has certain things it does or methods. And there's variables that I could change on each object, like the text that is displayed, right? So now I'm going to code it in VB, in VB. The coding scheme in VB, the coding scheme is object dot property equals setting. Object dot property equals setting. OK? 
Okay, so I'm going to say button one dot text equal J maybe. All right, I could say that, or I could even say button dot one dot color equal blue. So object dot property equal setting. Okay, so that's the syntax for BB or one of those. I'm going to go in and and when an action occurs, when the first button is clicked, right? I could say hey. I could say, what's the object? It is label, it is label one, label one dot text is equal to capital L. And I come back here, and when this is clicked, I could say, hey, label one dot text is equal to K when the second button is clicked. And when I come back here, I could say it's equal to in. And now, dude, my program is totally ready to run. So I come up here and I debug it, I run it, and if all goes well, I have just created a functional program, an executable chunk of code, which I could email to my friends and they could run on any of their computers. If I'm sad, I click the sad button. If I'm chill, I click the chill button. If I'm happy, ah! Oh! <laughs> ah. Chill. Okay, that works. Sad. Ah! All right, that works. Happy. Ah! Oh! Why has death smiled on me? Ah! Okay, so that's a programming error. There's two types of programming errors. This is called debugging a computer. We debug a computer. I told you where debugging comes from, right? Back in the day, they used to create computers out of vacuum tubes, and the moss would fly into the computers. And then the moss would burn out the vacuum tubes, and they'd have to go in and pick the moss out of the vacuum tubes, so they called it debugging the computer. They'd actually pick the bugs out of the computers. So now when we debug software, we're looking for two types of errors. One is a logic error. So this is a logic error, right? Sad, works, chill, works, happy, doesn't work. The, the program's still running, but it's a logic error. It didn't give me the intended result. So logic error in a calculator would be 2 plus 2 equals 39. No, that's not right. That's a logic error. A syntax error would be like this. Label dot yo mama text. Right? Now I'm going to run it. And it's going to say there were build errors. Would you like to continue and run the last successful build? No. And it now says, yo mama text is not a member of systems.windows.forms.label. So I'd have to fix that so I could double click that and it takes me to it. And that would be a syntax error because I typed in the wrong syntax. Because just like if I use the wrong words, you don't know what I'm salamakani. Salamatu palamani. Bala. Just like if I use the wrong words, communication stops, right? Like I have to use certain words to program your minds and convey information to you. We have to use certain words with the computer. So we use the wrong words, the wrong syntax, the computer throws a syntax error. So to fix the logic error, I need to say, hey, display capital J. And now I run it and sad, chill, happy. <gasps> Yay, it worked, it worked. And I could do all kinds of other changing variables. So you could change variables during design time. This is design time right here, right? Like I could change variables right here. I could, you know, change this to happy, 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 really happy, right? That text. Or I could change variables during runtime, which means I write the code so when that button gets pushed, it runs. And, and during runtime, the variables change. So I might change variables like this. I could say button one, button one dot, I think it's called back color. Back color is equal to uh, aqua. And I could do button two dot back color is equal to aqua. And I could do button three dot back color is equal to, guess, aqua. Okay, and I could put that all on all three, right? And then, okay, button one is clicked. I don't want it to be aqua. I want it to be 
beige, bisque, black, blanched almond, burly wood. Let's go with burly wood. And likewise, when button two is clicked, I want it to be burly wood. And when button three is clicked, I want it to be burly wood. So now watch what happens. All right? When I first start, nothing, but I click sad. Now that one's that color, and these are those colors. Okay, and now I click chill. Ew, that's cool. And I click happy. Uh, so logic error again, right? What happened? I put this in the wrong place. So this needs to be here. And this needs to be here. You're like, I have no idea how that makes a difference. Me, 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 me. Me, 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 me. <laughs> you can see how this becomes like something where you're staying up till 4 a.m. creating the stupidest things in the world and you think it's like, wow, it's cool. Because it is kind of cool. Because you are playing the role of God. Because what is God if not the master who created everything? You have become God. And before you know it, you'll be living in your mother's garage or in your parents' basement becoming the master of your own universe. And occasionally, for some of you, you'll become like Mark Zuckerberg, or Steve Jobs, or Steve Wozniak, or Peter and Sergey, Larry and Sergey, Google. It's pretty awesome. That's programming. Object-oriented programming, structured programming, spaghetti code, what a program is, set of instructions, algorithms, explicit step-by-step -step instructions. That's programming. A few more things you should know about. Holy crap, there's quite a few actually. We'll get through them quick. There's something called the program development life cycle. Just like last week we learned about the systems development life cycle. The PDLC is a problem solving process where you just analyze the problem, you design a solution, you, you create the solution, you test it, you implement it and maintain it. Right? So it's just a problem solving process. Program de design life cycle. Uh, there's principles for good program design, of course. When you're designing stuff, you'll often flow chart out the logic that is occurring. Where, where do decisions get made, right? Like this would be like where a decision's made, yes or no, right? Where is data required or where does output occur, print, print? Where does input occur, right? So processing, start, decision, connector, input, output. Here's the schematics for what the different symbols mean. And you create a flow chart. Like, so you'd have a flow chart maybe for like how how do how do how do how how do how does uh, how does WebAdvisor allow you to enroll into classes? Right? And at one point it asks you the question, do you want to enroll in another class? Yes, okay, do this. No, okay, do that. So you would have one of these things here. Do you want to enroll in another class? Yes, okay, do this. Take them back up here, right? No, okay, take them here. Yeah? So you flow chart out the logic. There's also something called pseudocode. Pseudo means kind of like fake. Pseudo fake. Pseudocode is like you don't actually write it in the actual programming language code, but you just write it in, in English kind of like you're going to start here, we'll set the counter to zero, while, we'll read a record. While there are records to process, we'll do these if else statements. If this, then do that. If company, if they have computer service, if they have computer experience, and if the company service is greater than five years, then print employee name and increment the counter. Right? Otherwise, go to the next statement. Other, you know, and nesting if statements is actually bad program design in my book. It's better to have multiple if statements. Right? So I rewrite this where if they have computer experience and if computer experience greater, if they have computer experience and company service greater than five years, then do this, right? If computer experience uh, in less than five years, do that. If no computer experience, then do this, right? I would write it like that, because that for me is hard to track. That gets spaghetti-ish again a little bit. So I don't nest if, if statements. Back in my vast coding days, when I was a while, coder roaming the ranges, slinging my keyboard, other desperados, like the Wild West. It's a dangerous job being a coder. 
Coding, coding. I know somebody who's such a coder and named their kid Coden. Coden and named their kid Coden. It's kind of interesting. And choosing a programming language, things to consider, right? Basically, you just want to choose what's most popular, how many programmers are out there doing it. Obviously, some languages are better for some jobs than others, but I would say, hey, you want to learn about programming? Take Java. Take Java. Java is like a hugely, widely acceptable language used in a lot of places. We offer an introduction to Java class here at City College. Um, that's the way I'd send you. When you code, there are coding standards, right? So when we talk about databases, I'll show you one of the coding standards, meaning, oh, there's certain conventions that you do. So when you name stuff, you name it in a certain way, so later when you're looking in the code, there's like little acronyms built into the name, you know, that tell you, oh, this is where that, that variable is coming from. It's coming from this area, this database, this table. So there's coding conventions. You also leave uh, notes, right? So uh, comments, they're called comments. You leave comments. You know, like what, what exactly, who wrote this program? When did they last write it? What does it do? And so each line of code that you write or each little chunk that you write, you leave a little comment. This is what this does. This is what this does. So when you get fired and they hire somebody else, they can fire you easily and they can bring somebody else in and, they, and they'll understand the code. That's the idea. So th it's more transferable. Uh, testing, there's beta testing and uh, alpha testing is testing inside the organization. Sometimes you'll see like beta software, that's beta testing. That's testing it outside the organization. And once your, uh, once your program code is written, there's a couple of languages with computers. There's machine language, okay, that's zeros and ones. Then there's machine language and then there's assembly language on top of that. It's like the second generation. Then there's procedural languages, that's most programming languages, that's third generation languages. And then there are query, uh, what, do they call them structured? I don't know, I'm just going to call them query languages, right, for databases, that's fourth. And then there's natural language and that's fifth, and that's us. And so when you write something in a third generation language, for the computer to understand it, it needs to be eventually translated down to zeros and ones, to machine language. And that's called, that could occur by either running a translator or a compiler or an assembler. Compilers compile the whole program into a big pile of zeros and ones. Interpreters will translate, translate just a few lines for you, uh, or translators will translate a few lines for you. Uh, so that's called source code and object code. The source code would be the language you wrote in. The object code is the 0 and 1 machine language version of that program. And that's why you hear about open source, because you actually get to see the third generation language in which a program was written and play with that. Looking at the zeros and ones, you can't change the code on that easily, very easily at all, if at all. So languages. The end. The end. You guys have your little sheet. We'll go over it Thursday with the key terms. I'll look it over tonight. Anybody have any questions or thoughts? How many people are completely blown away by my programming expertise? <laughs> cool. I'm impressed with this. Uh, questions, comments, thoughts? None of the above. You guys have like 25 minutes to do whatever the heck you like. Turn your computers on and uh, work on what you would like. What you would like.